thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, so as you know, uh, previous panel talked about shared service framework tools, but also outlined the necessity to have data that enable them to stay ahead of the game and understanding the threat landscape. I have a couple of speakers with uh, this session. Uh, and they will present on threat intelligence sharing platform and tools. Uh, the desired outcome is to reflect on the strategic role of such platform in promoting collaboration among CERT and supporting national and regional exchange information model. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Andras Iklodi. Uh, Andras works at the uh, Luxembourgian Computer Security Incident Response Team, uh, SERP, as software developer. And he has been developing the MIST core since early 2013. Uh, Andras, uh, over to you, please. Thanks a lot, uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, the plan is to talk a little bit about um, information sharing via MISP, and also a little bit about uh, what we as a CSERT uh, do with MISP as well. So I hope that my screen sharing is working now. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so a little bit uh, to start this whole thing out with what is MISP in the first place and what is the thing that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, MISP is a threat information sharing platform, so it's free and open source. We've been developing it for a pretty long time now, so the whole thing started in uh, 2012, early 2012, late 2011, so quite a long time ago. And it's been improved over and over by the community and, and by us as well uh, uh, ever since. So it, it, basically the idea of a tool like this, uh, a threat intelligence platform in general, is that you're taking in data from all sorts of sor uh, sources. Now, MISP is a little bit different than some of the other threat intel platforms is that it has a heavy focus on sharing. So that means that a large part of the data that we're dealing with uh, with MISP is basically data that we are receiving from our partners, from our community, uh, from other C-certs, uh, and so on, as well as OSIN data, obviously. So we take all of this data uh, uh, that we produce ourselves, that we receive from OSINT, that we receive from our partners, we harmonize this information, we correlate it, and we enrich it uh, via our internal tools, via the different tools that, uh, and subscriptions that we have uh, for services. And then we can collaborate on this information and feed our automated protective tools with this information. Uh, so that's one of the main outputs of, of, uh, of such a tool. So this is just a quick idea of what MISP is and what threat intel sharing platforms in the first place are. So who are we? We, uh, we are basically an organization called Circle, and we are the uh, Luxembourgish uh, National Sea Search for the Private Sector. So that means that we're funded by the Ministry of Economy to build security for the community at large. Now, Luxembourg is one of these weird countries that is very interconnected due to the fact that a lot of organizations are incorporated in Luxembourg. So we, uh, we have a pretty wide reach in terms of what we consider our constituency. And, and, we, and we want to basically build these tools and data that we're building uh, for the global community because of that. Uh, we're also partially co-funded by various EU projects to build, a, build our tools, including MISP. Uh, so basically, our, our, our involvement with MISP is that we are leading the development of the tool, um, as well as projects related to it, as well as managing a bunch of different communities out there for the private sector, for CSERT networks, uh, for law enforcement, military uh, and intelligence uh, communities, financial sector, and so on. Uh, and at the end of the day, we also have users of the tool. So we, we, we can give you also a perspective of, of uh, what sort of uh, issues we're trying to tackle as a C-cert, basically, uh, using the tooling uh, itself. So first of all, before we get uh, look into the, uh, w uh, the how and why uh, of, for using tools like this, let's talk a little bit about open source. And this is something that, uh, that has been a recurring topic, I think, during the day. Um, and the advantages and disadvantages of open source. Uh, I, I think that one of the most overlooked uh, and one of the most important advantages of open source tooling is, is really that we're that most of us uh, that, that are in CSERTs or, or, or SOCs or other security uh, uh, teams, we have a fixed budget that we're 
kind of tiptoeing around every year. And there is no way around it. We have to fit everything that we have to do into that budget. Now, where we spend the budget has a different impact on how we as an organization can grow over time. So generally, when we're, in, when, when we're looking into different tools that we can use, we have the option of either buying services, so going to a service provider that will do all of these tasks for us. The downside of that is that we are at the mercy of the service provider. Our data is usually not kept within our own premises. And depending on what happens with the service provider, it might have a, an operational impact on what we do. On the other hand, we can also purchase tools and basically run those, uh, those uh, proprietary tools ourselves uh, in-house. Now, the downside of that is that we, besides uh, the typical uh, issues that come up, like uh, not, not being able to vet the source code, for example, of the tool and know what the tool actually does under the hood, uh, is that uh, most of our budget will be end up spending on licensing and support. That means there's very little what we can do ourselves to influence how the tool works. And if issues pop up, it's our support contracts that, that, that we have to rely on. So it's not a bad option in terms of keeping the data in our own network, but it's still a black box that we're dealing with, so to say, and we're still ending up spending our budget on the licensing and the support. Now, open source, on the other hand, allows us to take our entire budget that we have for the tooling and invest it in personnel uh, that will run the tool and that will basically improve the tool. Uh, and the advantage of that, that is that, that training our own uh, colleagues uh, or hiring more, uh, uh, more team members ends up uh, growing the maturity of us as an organization. So these are reusable skills uh, and the personnel that we basically end up hiring to manage these tools can be used for other tasks at the same time. So it's a net win for the organization. I think this is a really overlooked uh, fact. So I highly encourage everyone to also take this into consideration when you are making those decisions between open source and proprietary tools uh, that basically the entire budget would in the end flow into uh, enriching your team. Now, some of the uh, let's look at some of the cases uh, uh, that we as a CSERT deal with, with sharing information in general, and, and where a, a platform like MIS becomes interesting for us. Uh, so we basically take the different tasks that we do uh, uh, at our CERT in, in four main categories, um, especially those that have a, a, at least some information sharing uh, connections. We have our core services such as incident response. We have our proactive services that mostly deal with generating uh, security data like feeds or alerts or uh, notifications to our constituency uh, and also advanced services that mostly deal with uh, with collaborating uh, during incidents uh, with, with law enforcement with the judicial arm or with the victims themselves finally an, another main group is also uh, being an enabler for information sharing but we'll talk about that in a moment so Let's first look at the core services part. So I already mentioned that incident response is a huge part of, of, uh, of this pillar. Basically, uh, for us as CSERT, one of the uh, biggest tasks that we're dealing with, or one of the most voluminous tasks, is the incident response itself. That means whenever we are involved in, in, in the incident response uh, that we get called in by an organization, we basically have our process that we do, uh, uh, that we do starting from the, uh, from the capturing of the data, investigation itself, and then finally the outcomes and dissemination of the outcomes uh, to the community. So we basically use uh, MISPARTIP as a, uh, an internal storage for the ongoing uh, uh, flow of the information that we derive during the incident. So that means that if we're seeing ransomware case, we're extracting all the technical information and we're storing those in our uh, tip. We basically uh, derive indicators and correlate this information uh, on the go in the system. We enrich it using internal lookup systems that we host ourselves, uh, such as uh, passive SSL, passive DNS uh, systems, and so on, as well as all those services that we subscribe for, for example, virus total, domain tools, passive total, whatever. So a bunch of these different uh, services. Um, so we basically immediately get more information on the incident that we're dealing with uh, by inputting it in our system and it automatically running these correlations and lookups for us. So sometimes we uh, immediately see, okay, this is something that uh, the community already knows about. We don't really care about uh, that much about uh, deeply diving into it. We see what we're dealing with here. So we save ourselves a lot of time. 
Now, this is where OSINT information becomes interesting as well, because OSINT information allows us to cross-correlate information and see these are things that have been seen by uh, the community at large already. So we already get a pivot point that we can use to investigate further, whether it's fully overlapping with what was shared in the OSINT community, for example. We can also coordinate things like, uh, like the actual uh, instant response process. We can invite our partners to join our, uh, our MISP and to actually collaborate with them and, uh, in the entire instant response process and share what we are seeing as, we, as the analysis goes along. We also do some additional tasks with MISP, such as takedown requests. So what, one of the outcomes of, of an incident is often that we end up with a set of infrastructure that we're seeing is compromised and used uh, by the attackers. Then we issue takedown requests uh, to the uh, various service providers. Uh, so we have the tooling for that available in MISP to do that directly from there. And also we basically uh, have another system that we use to monitor um, uh, a bunch of different sources for information leaks and we share the information that we find there uh, through MISP as well. If you're interested in the tool, by the way, the link is there at the bottom. It's called Air Framework. It's also open source. So just feel free to install it and get started with it. Now for the proactive services, this is uh, where we produce data. So that means that, uh, that both as an outcome of our internal analysis and research, as well as redistribution and enrichment of OSINT information uh, goes, uh, goes into this pipeline. We basically take data from all these different sources. We put our own analysis efforts on top of it, and then we reshare that information back to our constituency. So we act as also an aggregator as well as an enrichment uh, uh, organization, basically, in this case. So uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into all the different options here. It's a pretty loaded uh, slide, so feel free to have a look at that afterwards. Uh, we have a lot of options there of what you can do. Now for the advanced services, this is something that, uh, uh, that obviously not every C-cert uh, or CERT will, will do in general, but for national C-certs, uh, this is something that is much more common to collaborate, for example, or be called into uh, uh, to, uh, to instant response cases where you also, uh, the uh, uh, victim also wants to involve law enforcement, for example, so this would be something where we would collaborate with them as well. Now, one of the interesting outcomes of a lot of these cases is also the disclosure and the sharing of vulnerability information. So we don't just share information about the actual threats themselves, but also very often engage with vendors uh, or with, uh, with uh, close communities to share information about the different vulnerabilities that are found. So even before it gets to the point where a CVE is being reported, there is already information sharing going on before that for the entire vulnerability uh, disclosure process. Uh, so you can coordinate the entire process, involve the vendor, uh, work on a fix or wait for them to report back uh, that the issues have been fixed and then go through the open process of reporting it. Finally, uh, and this is something that uh, for most uh, national entities will be interesting. Uh, uh, one of the things that we do is we also run a lot of communities for uh, sectorial uh, groups as well. So that means that if you want to be an enabler, for example, for the mandatory reporting duties of the different uh, communities, uh, this is something that you can very easily set up by running a MIS community for that specific sector, that specific group that needs to be involved in that. Also, another interesting side effect is that you can also use a community like that uh, uh, for the different members to be able to seek uh, additional help for collaboration. So very often uh, when it comes to uh, different levels of maturity of the of organizations, this is uh, more and more required. So besides these different sharing activities, one of the other goals that we generally have, and I highly encourage everyone to think about stepping outside of their sectors, their national boundaries, and start to build larger interconnected networks of sharing. Now, one of the interesting things is Obviously, the most, uh, most important data that you will be seeing is whatever targets you, your organization, your sector, your geographic location. But there is so much overlap going on between the different attacker techniques uh, that are targeting the different uh, uh, victims out there, that sharing the, uh, the information about these different attacks helps you basically see the trends of what attackers are doing in general. So uh, one of our, our, our goals basically uh, as CERT is also to bring together these different communities out there. A lot of the sharing in these, uh, these silos of sharing that have been popping up over the past decade, such as financial sharing communities and so on, are already somewhat well-organized. 
but the sharing between these different communities still needs an extra push. So this is where, uh, where all the c certs can play a, a huge role. So yeah, this is basically what I just went over. So we can hop over that. <laughs> Now, some, something else as an outcome of this entire process is that you're also raising the maturity of your community and you can really uh, uh, take additional steps to make this go faster than, uh, than it would naturally in a sharing community. So one of the things that you can do is uh, when you're sharing information, and this is a large part of information sharing nowadays, is not just to share data and information used to detect or block malicious uh, uh, actions, but also to share methodologies. So whenever you're sharing uh, what you, uh, the outcomes of an investigation, also share how you've reached those conclusions. One of the things that has been absolutely great to see in the community is, for example, the sharing of detection rules of, uh, of scripts that, uh, uh, that people use during uh, hunting uh, for, uh, for a given attack. Uh, these things being included together with the actual threat reports become super interesting when it comes to giving ideas to other organizations in your community on how they can uh, tackle similar threats in the future. And if you raise the maturity of your community, you will benefit from it uh, over, over the uh, longer period of time anyway. First of all, because you're interconnected in one way or another with your sector or with your uh, national community or also simply because you will get better information shared back to you that you can use. Uh, but with, with all of this, uh, anything that the, to that the tooling that, uh, that we're talking about here will solve for you, nothing will actually overcome the toughest challenge of all of that, and that is building trust. So having communities, having community gatherings is one of the most important parts of the entire process. And also setting up play, uh, playing rules that basically everyone can agree to. So to get started with MISP, uh, you have basically different ways if, you, if you're interested in it. First of all, if you're a first.org member, you already have access to a MISP instance. So log into the uh, uh, MISP instance of first. Uh, you, you should automatically get access if you're authenticating via the uh, uh, IEM solution of, uh, of first. Uh, and finally, if you want to uh, join any national or sectorial MISP in, in your region, reach out to, uh, to them if they have a MISP. And if they have a community, and if no, you can always set up your own. It's an open source tool. All you need is a server that you uh, that uh, that you can maintain and install MISP on, and then you're good to go. And then you can start interconnecting with uh, peers, with other communities out there, and start uh, exchange of uh, information with them. So MISP itself is one tool out of uh, many that you uh, that you should be looking at uh, for open source tooling. Nowadays, you can pretty much build your entire tool chain out of open source tools if you're a C-cert. So we're living in pretty good times for that. Uh, we have another tool that we're working on currently called Cerebret that we in particular want to build as a community management tool. So this tool is being built as part of a new funded project called Millicertus 2. The idea behind this tool is to, first of all, do community management, tool interconnection orchestration, as well as fleet management for tools like MISP. So to summarize this whole thing, because I think I'm being a bit slow here, uh, what you get out of all of this is you end up with structured actionable information that you can use for detection, blocking, and so on, based on what your community produces, what OSINT data you get from, uh, from out there, uh, what data you get from vendors, and so on. And you can collaborate on this information uh, and also on your ongoing incidents using this information and build your uh, uh, protective tools out of that uh, pretty easily. And also, uh, last but not least, again, uh, raising the maturity of your community should be always uh, one of the main goals of running a community like that. So if you're looking into that direction, this is one of the biggest outcomes on there. There are some ways to connect to us and some ways to get more information listed there on the last slide. So feel free to reach out to us anytime if you have questions, if you get stuck with, with it, or if you just want to validate your ideas on how to build a community, just let us know and we're here to help. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andres, uh, for your presentation around uh, community building tool and uh, this. Um, something that comes uh, often uh, in uh, information sharing is uh, uh, the need for a vocabulary of event recording and uh, incident sharing and also 
uh, being able to like have a kind of common languages for describing security incident. Uh, on this note, I will I would like to invite John Green. Uh, John Green has over 19 years of experience leading investigation of of data breach and cybersecurity incident with the government and civilian security sector. Uh, over to you, uh, John. Thank you very much. Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. So as, you, as I was introduced, my name is John Grimm. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Veris framework, the vocabulary event recording and incident sharing. It's a framework that we use here at Verizon for building out our data breach investigations report. It's our annual publication into the world of cybersecurity incidents and data breaches. We've been using Veris for a number of years. The DBIR is 14 years old and Veris almost goes back and far uh, in time uh, in terms of that report itself. So I have a background in digital forensics and cyber counterintelligence uh, from both the US Army, as well as my years here with Verizon in the, uh, the corporate world dealing with data breaches for our customers. So today I'm gonna to hone in on the A4 threat model, which is a core component of the Veris framework. This is something that organizations can use for both cyber threat hunting, as well as uh, incidents, as well as some other use cases that I'll use toward the end of today's session. So let me go ahead and get into defining the Veris A4 threat model. So it consists of four A's as, as you probably very much uh, can imagine with the, the title of A4 threat model. It's actors and actions, assets and attributes. So actors are the subject of the sentence if you're looking at a typical English sentence where these are the folks who are conducting the actions which is the verb of the sentence. So actors and actions go hand in hand. They help us understand who the threat actors are. The assets and the attributes are the object of the sentence. The assets are what is being impacted in terms of the threat actor activities and the attributes are how we are showing the impact to those assets. And specifically, we're using the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So if you're interested in learning more about Veris, the A4 threat model and the Veris schema in general, please visit the links that are on the bottom left of the screen, veriscommunity.net, as well as github.com. I'll provide these links at the end of the session as well. So let's look at the outputs from using the Veris A4 threat model. So this is just an example of data, data that I queried against our data set from the DBIR. We have uh, the DBIR data set, which has 83 different contributors worldwide in our data set that's looking at breaches and cybersecurity incidents. So here I'm primarily looking at breaches on the screen here that I'm sharing. And these are breaches as defined by Cybersecurity incidents where, say, where there's confidentiality impact at 100% of the time. What does that mean? That means we've confirmed that a data breach occurred. There's been a, a, an exfiltration of breach or a compromise of data, exfiltration of data, I should say, or a compromise of that data. So on the very left-hand side, you can see that data varieties and privacy breaches. This is how we show the confidentiality attribute. We're looking at 2020 data, 2,271 different breaches. And you can see here percentage-wise the breakdown of personal versus credentials, medical, bank payment, and internal. This is very informative. This gives you an idea of what's happening out there with breaches involving privacy data. When we look at the actors, which is the first A of the A4 threat model, highlighted here the top three actors, looking at 666 different breaches involving privacy data. Uh, organized crime, as you can see, is number one, followed by unaffiliated and system administrator. So the first two are external actors. The third one is system administrator, which is an internal actor, followed by developer and end user, which are also internal actors. So this gives us some granularity beyond where they're coming from. I'll talk a little bit more about who these threat actors are, or more specifically, the different varieties of threat actors here shortly. But I just wanted to give you an example here of what the information looks like. When we look at the verb for the subject verb object of the Veris A4 threat model, you can see here looking at 1,847 data breaches involving privacy. We've got use of stolen credentials, which is a hacking action variety, followed by misconfiguration, which is an error action variety, and phishing, which is a social action variety. So this kind of gives you an idea from the standpoint of cyber defenses, as well as intelligence, where to focus your defenses on in terms of privacy breaches and how the threat actors are 
actioning against uh, those assets that they're targeting. So speaking of the assets, which is the third AVA fourth threat model, these are the asset varieties and privacy breaches looking at the 2020 timeframe, web application server at 55% and mail servers at 45, 44%, followed by database servers at 17%, and then documents, which is a form of media at 10%. And then finally, the fourth A here is attributes, and we're only looking at the integrity attributes. The confidentiality attribute is in the data varieties on the far left of the screen, and the availability, just not showing that as an example, but I will talk about that shortly. So you can see the top three integrity varieties and privacy breaches are software installation at 56%, altered behavior at 41%, and modified data at 22%. So this is an example of how you can use the data in terms of various and more specifically the A4 threat model to convey what's happening in terms of specifically here privacy data breaches. So let's let's take a step back here and look at the action. So I did skip over the actors. There are three actor categories, the external, internal, and partner. External actors do not have any legitimate access to the data, the assets, the environment. They're outside the bu building logically or physically they're halfway around the world logically they just do not have access and they're actually attacking or hacking into the environment the internal actors have some level of trust and privilege to the data the assets in the environment these folks are nefarious as well as folks that are committing errors so they're not necessarily nefarious so internal actors for various are those folks who have some level of trust and privilege they could be an end user they could be assistant uh, administrator they could be a manager they could be a finance person the actions are what the actors take. And there are seven action categories you can see here, starting from right to left are environmental and physical. Those are two actions that we see sometimes in our caseload, as well as in the overall DBIR data set. Not so much, though, compared to the other actions. A good example of the physical would be your payment card skimmers, for example. When we look at error, which is in the bottom left there, these are actions committed by the internal actors or the partners. The partners are actors who have some level of trust and privilege to the data, the assets, and the environment. Errors do not typically have a motive, but again, um, they are mistakes and they are committed by partners or internal uh, actors. Misuse is another action category that could be committed by an internal actor or a partner actor. This is exactly how it sounds. It's misusing or abusing something such as credentials or hardware or data, and it leads to a data breach. Social malware and hacking are the top three actions we typically see across the board. Social is the very front end typically of a path-based attack where it's a threat actor external to the organization that's leveraging the human element, sending out phishing emails, for example, or pretexting uh, the, the, the targeted entity and gaining access into the environment or gaining access to the data. Hacking are the actions taken by the attacker and malware are the actions taken by the malicious software. So these are the seven action categories. They're good to know. Um, but what's even more informative is knowing the varieties underneath each one of the actions. And this is just an example here of hacking actions and breaches. If you're interested in learning more about the data that's been uh, put together by our data scientists, you can simply go to the interactive website. The link is on the bottom. This is just screenshots from that website. This shows uh, actions from the standpoint of motives. Espionage motive in yellow at the top financial motive in orange at the bottom. So we've got two motives that we primarily see within the DBIR data set. Number one motive is financial by far. Number two is espionage. And then after that, there are some minor motives like such as fear, ideology, grudge, and fun, which I'm not showing here on the screen. So the varieties are the more um, detailed uh, information that falls under each of those seven action categories. Here, we're only looking at hacking actions. And the varieties here you can see for espionage, the number one variety is es exploit vulnerability, followed by use of backdoor or command and control. And for financial, the number one variety there for hacking is use of stolen credentials, followed by brute force. And in the inset there on the top right is vectors. It's another way that we can look at the data going beyond the varieties. We can look at the, the vectors or the pathways or, 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 or the, the methods, or, or I should say, um, the ways that threat actors are, or whatever threat actors are using uh, to gain access using those varieties, such as a web application, as you can see, or command shell, desktop sharing software for espionage, and then web application, desktop sharing, and backdoor C2 for uh, the financial. So another way to look at the data, the results of uh, using the various framework, or more specifically, 
um, using the A4 threat model. So this is what it looks like behind the scenes. Um, if you're interested in learning more behind the scenes, please go to veriscommunity.net. This is just, again, an example of the hacking action variety and the hacking action vector. So we define hacking in this particular uh, case on the left-hand side there. And the columns are in the middle and to the right. The three columns that you see first are the hacking action varieties in the format of action.hacking.variety. I underline some of the ones that we typically see over the years, such as brute force, DOS or denial of service, uh, use of backdoor C2. And then on the far column is the action.hacking.vector, which is our hacking action vectors. Backdoor C2 are some of the more common ones we see. Desktop sharing, as well as command shell, VPN, and web application. So it doesn't look as, as nice behind the scenes here, but this just gives you an idea of the variety of different varieties for hacking actions, as well as vectors. Um, that you can code if you're going to use the Veris framework and the A4 threat model. Now, of course, this is uh, by far uh, not everything that can occur out there. If you have something that's unknown and you're not sure, you can code it as unknown. And if it's other and it's not fitting within the bulletized um, varieties and vectors here, you can certainly code it as other, or you can expand Veris and start including newer hacking varieties and vectors as you know, technology progresses. Okay, so let's look at an example of using Veris for coding. So this is uh, VCDB coding. So this is the Veris Community Database. This is an open source project where organizations, folks can use Veris code, publicly disclosed breaches and incidents into the Veris framework. And this is just a graphical example of a famous um, or, or, or a well-known case that involved uh, ransomware and specifically it's the Colonial Pipeline. So. On the left-hand side, you can see an excerpt from an article, May 7th, that outlines what happened with the attack. It's great to read, but it's very heavy in terms of text. If we use Veris to code what happened with those, that publicly disclosed breach, you can see the graphic here in the middle and you know, to the right-hand side of your screen here that talks about the different components of Veris. So we've got victim demographics there on the top left. On the top right, our discovery method, which was actor disclosure, something that we typically see with a ransomware attack. In the top uh, middle is attributes, your confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So was there data disclosure? Absolutely yes, that means it's a breach. What kind of data varieties was it? Internal, as well as credentials. Integrity was involving software installation and the availability is obscuration, something we'd see with uh, encrypted files. The bottom left are actor, action, and assets. The three A's of the four, A4 threat model, the top a attributes is the fourth A, so we can see it's an external actor, financial motive using hacking and malware and attacking a database. And then you can see the event chain there, event one, two, three, and four, walking through the hacking, the malware actions, uh, telling the story from that standpoint. So just an example here of coding with Varus as I move through here. Another way that you can use Varus is the A4 uh, grid. So taking those four components of the A4 threat model the actors, the actions, the assets, and the attributes, and putting it into a grid here. So the very far left, you can see assets.attributes. That would be the y-axis, and the x-axis would be the actors.actions. I believe I got that right, x and y. And you can see how the, you can pair these up and then look at your organization's incidents or breaches and start filling in these squares to get a heat map and giving you an idea of where you need to focus your cyber defenses and your detection response efforts. So another tool that you can use for Veris. Finally here for Veris, we have the Veris framework here in the center, which is very good for incidents and breaches. That's what it's focused on. It doesn't get into attribution per se, or some of the more specific details in terms of IOCs or even countermeasures or controls. So what we've done is we've mapped the Veris framework to MITRE attack techniques. You can see that on the left-hand side to help fill out better what's happening with the attacker activities. And we've also mapped various framework to the sys controls on the right hand side to better um, convey what countermeasures to control should be taken by a cyber defender. So we've been using the sys controls for a number of years in the DBIR, and we've been using the minor attack techniques for the last couple of years in terms of helping to show folks um, what's happening out there with the threat actors specifically. So various use cases. So as you can see, we developed Veris as a way to share information, a common framework, a common language for, 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 for discussing events, analyzing and including in our DBIR. 
This is something that we uh, put together a number of years ago in the early days of the DBIR that really helped facilitate collection and analysis. It's something that we've opened up to the public. So as you can imagine, um, it is a common framework, a lingua franca for sharing information. Um, it's also codifiable or codifiable or verisizable and shareable from that standpoint. It's good for metrics, performance measurement, risk management assessment, resource justification, and strategic planning. Uh, a lot of organizations look forward to the release of the DBIR every year so that they can do their strategic planning and resource justification. But other organizations may use the DBIR and or Veris to help understand what's happening in their environment. I mentioned the Veris Community Database previously. That is one of the contributors to the DBIR. It's the only data set that you ever know who the attackers were, or I'm sorry, who the defenders were because it was publicly disclosed breaches. So you can use the VCDB to compare and contrast what's happening in your environment in terms of looking at it through the various lens. We've also mapped to the sys controls as well as the minor attack. And then finally, you can use it simply for incident triage for your SOC, your CSERT, and your different teams, and threat modeling for your CTI attribution and your threat hunting. So if you're interested in learning more, there's some resources here. The top three bullets are the DBIR and the interactive website that I showed a couple screenshots from to include DBIR facts, figures, and data. The middle three bullets are specific to the Veris framework, the A4 threat model, and the Veris schema on veriscommunity.net and github.com. And then finally, the last three are the Veris community database, Veris web app, and the Veris coding style guide. So we do have a web application that's, that's available to code your incidents and your breaches within your environment into the Veris web app. Um, it's something you can use internally and not share with anyone. Um, we do ask if you're interested in becoming a DBIR contributor um, that you verisize your data first and you anonymize it. Veris is meant to, um, is built with, uh, with that in mind, anonymizing the data before you send it to our data scientists for inclusion in the DBIR. That brings us to the end of the session. And let's see if there's any, any questions at all. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, get question at the end to mm -hmm. uh, deal with that. Uh, that is awesome. You just responded to a discussion that happened uh, last last week about challenges mm -hmm. in uh, sharing event information, and I'm very glad that we were able to make this presentation and also very delighted to see how. Mm -hmm varies with uh, minor attack and uh, CIS control. Uh, thank, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I think so we talk about platform and uh, John just presented uh, about uh, vocabulary and uh, uh, need to have a kind of common language for describing security incident in a structured and repeatable manner, but where do you get those data? Um, I would like to invite uh, Piotr uh, from Shadow Server Foundation uh, to talk to us about uh, how Shadow Server contribute to uh, coordinating large scale uh, data collection and analysis and also uh, Shadow Server work with uh, CSERT and various organizations. Uh, Pierre, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jean-Robert. Uh, thank you for having me uh, in this session. Um, yeah, so my name is Pat Kievsky. Um, can you see my, my uh, presentation in full screen? Just making yes, sure. Yes, we can see that. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll talk about, uh, well, uh, Shadow Server and uh, sharing uh, free threat uh, intelligence at, at scale. Uh, this is mostly raw threat intelligence, so you still have to do some processing um, uh, on, on the way up, so to speak. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll give an overview and uh, also from the point of view of, of, of Africa and, and the, the Arab region um, as well. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Shadow Server, um, Shadow Server is not for profit. Um, working to make the internet more secure for everyone. We are uh, US-based and Netherlands-based. And we have been around for, for well, over 15 years already and uh, have been, well, essentially uh, giving data away for free to uh, national CSERTs and any organization that owns a network. So is it be it an ISP, uh, uh, an enterprise, a bank, a university, um, 
essentially anyone that has any 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 address space uh, assigned to them. Um, we have many unique sources uh, from many takedown operations conducted with law enforcement. Um, we have a global vantage point and proven partnerships with um, many national CSERTs around the world, law enforcement agencies and industry and security researchers worldwide. Most importantly, what we share, we share at uh, no cost uh, to, to the end user at all. Um, Shadow Server um, uh, collects a lot of information and we do it at, at, at big scale. Uh, there are very many data sets we collect at scale at Shadow Server. These, these just are highlights. Of, of some of them. Um, we are pretty well known for scanning the internet all the time. So we have like uh, the slide here is 45, but we actually have 68 uh, scans running uh, every single day. Um, so we have a whole history of, of, of the internet as it's seen from, uh, from, uh, from outside um, with, with scanning for the last few years. Um, we disrupt uh, botnets. Um, we, we think all uh, threats uh, by typically by taking over over various uh, domain names like used uh, for criminal infrastructures, and we redirect them to our own um, own infrastructure. So we have insight into infected uh, infected end users, which we then share out. Uh, we run sensor networks, honeypots, essentially thousands of honeypots uh, all around the world running uh, simultaneously, uh, which gives good insight into various IoT related attacks or, or um, attacks uh, orient oriented at web applications or any essentially any exposed service. Um, we collect uh, malware data at, at scale um, with over uh, essentially a million uh, unique by hash malware samples every single day for a total repository of 1.5 billion samples. And we run these through sandboxes, um, including our own proprietary ones. So that gives insight into uh, what the latest malware is doing. Um, we collect uh, digital, uh, we collect SSL certificates at scale. So we have uh, essentially like 50, 60 million uh, collected every single day. That gives good insight into criminal infrastructure as well, because criminals also use um, uh, SSL certificates uh, to encrypt the traffic. And all of this and well, other data sets is around 12 petabytes of, of malware and threat intelligence stored. And uh, the results are shared with, uh, with network owners. Um, so many, any organization owns a network over 6,000 and uh, national C certs in, uh, in that cover 173 countries and, and territories. And a lot of this is also used for, for uh, law enforcement uh, investigations. So our primary service uh, and uh, the one uh, it's easiest to subscribe to, it's, it's everything is, is automated here are our reports. And, and there is no reason not to subscribe and get these reports because if we are seeing something, uh, then it's very likely a criminal actor is also seeing something and they can use uh, these uh, the things also that we find to actually get into your network. And it's better to learn from us than from a ransomware note that you have been uh, been compromised so no reason uh, not to not to subscribe um to give you an idea of, of the scale uh we, we see around 200 million for uh, accessible open vulnerable services per day on average um and about 5 million infected addresses per day on average globally just in our sinkhole so that's without the honeypots dark nets or 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 other means of observing observing attacks um, for Africa, um, around 2.2 million accessible, open, vulnerable services. That doesn't mean all of them are vulnerable, but the ones, ones we can see and uh, under certain circumstances, they can be exploited. And around 450,000 infected addresses per day on average in Africa. Um, the profile for Africa is a bit different. As we can see, a larger percentage of devices infected is, 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 is like um, Android um, instead of like the, the more infrastructure server side based things we see in, in, in Europe or, or the US. Um, national C certs receiving feeds. So uh, countries in green have a national entity um, receiving um, our our data on a, on a daily basis. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, there still is some work to do to do in Africa. Although we have improved over over the last year in terms of uh, outreach, and we provide data to at least twenty national C certs in Africa. But more uh, more to cover there. Also, also in, in, in the Arab states, uh, there, is, uh, there is some area of improvement. Uh, so um, like these are the latest um, uh, list of countries in Africa with uh, missing C certs, getting data at the national level. So this can be a government C cert or an entity set up as a national C cert or somebody acting um, as a de facto national C cert if there is no, no, official, no official presence. 
if you have uh, contacts in, in any of these countries or are from any uh, of these countries, then please please let us know and maybe we can uh, we can help out and and, and share data there. Similarly, with uh, with Arab states, uh, uh, there is there there are a few that that could have um, uh, could receive data uh, at the national level from us as well. Um, these are direct report recipients, uh, so entities that have signed up directly to us, so not national certs, so you can see the numbers for, for Africa. Typically, uh, these numbers are, well, unfortunately, uh, pretty low, just a few um, entities in a country, often multinationals that simply own, own IP space also in, in, in these countries. Um, in Africa, predominantly South Africa, Kenya. Um, have, have have the most, uh, but essentially even larger countries like large countries like Nigeria, Egypt, uh, just just have a few uh, entities uh, receiving data directly. So if you have like uh, contacts with ISPs or other organizations that you think should be receiving our feeds directly, just also uh, please uh, point them uh, point them to us. Similarly, for for the Arab states, uh, coverage uh, could be um, much better with with the highest coverage being in, in the Emirates, um, as such. The other countries, uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, still um, pretty pretty low. Um, and this is an ASN view of of all the ASNs out there that are assigned to Africa that are actually receiving our data. Um, and uh, you can see in red essentially the ASNs that are unfortunately not receiving uh, data. So uh, well quite a lot uh, to, to improve here in, in terms of giving data to uh, directly to organizations without uh, national certs uh, as, as a proxy. Um, it looks uh, even worse for, for Arab states, so those Arab League states, um, uh, lots, uh, lots to improve here in, in the biggest telecoms um, out there um, as well. Um, our reports are, are described on our website. Uh, every report is, is different. Um, there are Approaching, we're approaching 80 um, reports uh, right now, and essentially they they will report on infections, vulnerabilities, uh, DDoS attacks, um, uh, essentially your assets that are exposed on a daily basis, and in some cases there can be quite a lot of data. I, I showed the uh, total totals that we actually see uh, for 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 the continent and for the African continent and the world. Um, one thing that you may want to know is that there are many optional reports that you can also request from us that you're probably not getting. So if you're already subscribing to, to our, our data, you should ask for a subscription to all the optional reports if you're interested, and then you can have a good um, asset inventory that we will essentially conduct for you on a, on, a, on a daily basis. And we've also actually um, started to introduce various IPv6 scans. Um, this is slowly being rolled out, um, so you could probably subscribe to those as well. And best of all, we have an API that you can easily integrate with, with your tools and, and to fetch our data automatically, or if you wish, you can opt for the old delivery methods of emails and, and web links. Example reports, um, they have, um, they're pretty well described, I hope, on, on the website. Each report has examples, uh, all the fields, uh, columns um, identified. Um, essentially, all the reports are shared in CSV format, or if you use the API, you can also use um, JSON, JSON format. Subscribing is extremely easy. There is no um, big process involved. You just have to uh, get in, uh, uh, fill out the web form that uh, that requests some basic information that we try also to use to, to verify your, your identity. And there is no formal agreement uh, that you have to sign or anything like that. If we verify you are who you are, then uh, you will get these, this, this data well, pretty quickly. So um, there's lots of data sets that we're sharing and there's little time to actually uh, go through that, so, so I won't. Um, these are just some examples, uh, just an example like for vulnerable exchange servers, there's lots of lots happen, happening regarding Hafnium and, and, and other actors uh, um, exploiting the, the uh, Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities from uh, the first uh, quarter of, of the year. And uh, here is like an example of data that you could have received if, uh, if, if you were subscribed at that time, um, essentially vulnerable um, exchange servers, also web shells, this kind of uh, information that we discovered. Um, this is what Africa looked like on uh, at, at that at that time at at, uh, at the time of that that incident, with South Africa being uh, most exposed and then Egypt uh, second, um, other countries uh, to a to a lower lower degree. Um, similarly, here for a, 
for for uh, for more Arab Arab regions, uh, large focus like maybe in this case on 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 the Emirates as as being the um, primary affected uh, entity, but also Saudi and 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 others as well. Um, our feeds, uh, well, you can uh, you can either write parsers for them, uh, but they're also uh, of your own. But there are also many open source tools uh, that you can get uh, to actually fetch uh, fetch the data, and they'll parse it, normalize it for you automatically, and also share it out uh, with with your community. Many of these are very focused on a national C certs. Uh, there are some gaps, I think, with tools for for ISPs, for instance, or other organizations that these tools could be adapted uh, to handle, but that's that's another story. Um, you can also use uh, commercial tools. Uh, a number of these, uh, these, these exist. If, if you are interested in commercial tools and aren't aware of them, you can also contact us and we can tell you which, which exist um, uh, as well if, if you don't uh, want to use uh, open, source, uh, open source software, which you should. Um, one thing we also do for, for community building is, is honeypot sensor networks. So we run large scale um, honeypot sensor networks. Honeypot is a service framework um, where you could actually run a honeypot in, in your network and get it um, essentially rapidly deployed in a thousand locations even um, worldwide uh, within minutes essentially. Um, and this is a project that, that we run that currently uh, uh, has a number of different honeypot types operating, proprietary ones, as well as, uh, as, well as open source ones. Um, if you're interested in that, please, please contact us. Um, this is an example of, of the honeypot network that we are building a community honeypot network. Um, and uh, well, recently we have also been funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to expand in Africa and Indo-Pacific. That was at the start of the year and we have received funding to do it again. So we will be looking for, for, for new locations also, uh, especially in, in Africa and, and also the Commonwealth uh, countries. Um, Africa in more detail where we have sensors. So you can see um, South Africa is, is, is pretty well covered. Um, a few other countries like like Kenya, Egypt, um, uh, but uh, lots lots more to be covered uh, to be covered here, um, and this is all based on a framework that we developed uh, for for a European Commission funded project. So we can have an example of how an EU project has also um, impacted um, the world, hopefully um, positively. An example of how we collaborate uh, with entities, this is uh, not, not for Africa, but it's for Latin America, where we uh, partnered with CEDIA in Ecuador uh, to install a lot of sensors in, in Latin America. Um, we we're interested also in, in similar partnerships in, in, in Africa um, as well. Um, if you are able to host a sensor to help us help you, um, and, and the community, um, this is all, all that's needed, essentially a, a VM or a physical machine with very low spec. Um, uh, it just needs to be a clean, a clean Ubuntu install. Um, the biggest requirement for, for, for hosting a sensor is essentially a, 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 at least two IPv4 addresses have, have, to be, have to be assigned, preferably more, to actually run the honeypots when IP is, is, used, for, is used for management. Um, so we are trying to also to engage more and more in Africa. Um, as, as mentioned, we have uh, had a, a, a sponsored project from the UK FCDO. Now we have another UK FCDO project. So we are seeking more national CSERT and network owner uh, subscriptions in Africa, as well as more collaboration on, on the honeypots. And we are thinking of you know, how to focus in 2020 on making it easier to benefit from all our free services. So some things related to, to Africa um, that you can track on, on our blog. Um, we plan to publish a new blog on the threat landscape in Africa and, and uh, that uh, current threat landscape um, as at least uh, according to our data that's going to be published soon. So hopefully we'll also offer, offer some insight on, on what we see. And finally, to wrap up quickly, um, I think you know the data is, is, here, is, is here for free. Uh, it comes, it's, there is a lot of it. Um, we collect, uh, we were probably the biggest supplier of free threat intel um, worldwide. I think if you haven't subscribed, um, then you should subscribe. And if you're subscribing, you should probably ask for more, ask for the optional reports if you haven't already. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the best way to, to actually um, kickstart your cert if you don't have any or 
uh, or if you're if you're just started, or essentially even for a, for an advanced search, I think uh, it's getting more and more important to have a good understanding of uh, what assets they have to protect in in their country. And now, for instance, we introduced a new device identification report that enables you to understand what vendors and what models you actually have deployed in your network or, or your countries to give you insight into what you're actually protecting. I think that's that's a valuable report that's set on set, set up by default that you can also you can also get now. Um, so that's a very quick spin uh, through uh, what uh, what we offer. Um, uh, we're, we're a bit short on time and uh, we've overrun already. So I hope uh, this was uh, a good a good oversight. And um, well, if you have any questions or or or, or something uh, that you'd like to follow up, uh, please do. Um, we would be happy to uh, to engage and uh, well, hopefully make the internet a safer place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kira. Uh, I like the finger. We need you. <laughs> I think that <laughs> a couple of uh, countries. Uh, that you mentioned about uh, have not been receiving your feed yet uh, online. So this is the opportunity a colleague to engage with uh, Pure and the Shadow Server uh, to start receiving uh, uh, information related to your server ecosystem. Um, something that I will also like to mention to you, Pure, is that I understand that COVID has delayed a lot of projects, but I still believe that uh, let's say, God willing, next year we should think about uh, uh, the project of uh, conducting training related to uh, proceeding those, uh, those feeds that uh, people are receiving. It, it will bring a lot of relevance in how different teams and different organizations receive and proceed the information that they get for you and the, the different tools and arrangement that they can make around, around that information. Um, yeah, definitely happy, happy to engage there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in Pura's talk, he mentioned also running and de deploying Honeypot network. So the way I understand it is, and also from um, Andras' presentation is that you can either receive feed, but you can also produce feed. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Adli Wahid uh, from Epistrut to talk to us a little bit about uh, the community honeypot project uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, and uh, the arrangement around that. Um, Adil is a senior internet security specialist at APNIC and he is an active member of the security community, even a former first uh, member that was even in charge. I know that a uh, couple of teams that have received the fellowship from FIRST are online. So Adli was uh, one of the people behind that as well uh, at FIRST. And he is currently leading the APNIC Community Honeypot project. Uh, prior to joining APNIC, APNIC uh, he served the Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, and the Malaysia CERT. So, uh, Adli, over to you. Thank you, John Robert. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, I'm Adli from APNIC, and uh, it's almost uh, 3.30 AM here, but I'm still wide awake. Don't worry about that. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to talk a bit about our community HoneyNet project. I think a lot of things have been said earlier. Uh, I'm really happy to be here because I think some of our experience doing this um, activity here uh, might be relevant to our counterparts in the African and Arab region, because I think there are lots of similarities in terms of the security communities, activities, uh, the threat landscape, and, you know, the mixed nature of the maturity. So some economies have you know, very mature certs, very active security community. There are some countries who are still developing the capabilities and lots and lots of interest in uh, capacity development. Um, APNIC, we are the regional internet registry. So our core business is not really security, but we see capacity development and community engagement in this area as an important um, uh, activity or initiative. So uh, part of my role is to do lots of engagement, which means 
doing lots of training, um, supporting, uh, sharing information, and basically highlighting some of the things that were mentioned earlier by many of the speakers, you know, the free services by Shadow Server, the uh, MIS threat, uh, threat sharing platform, how to use it, who's using it, and what, uh, you know, what is the benefit uh, but the crowd or the audience that we are normally engaged with are the network operators, which uh, in most cases sometimes hold the key to fixing or doing resolution of many of the cybersecurity incidents that we face. Uh, at the same time, there are also interests from governments, uh, regulators, uh, law enforcement agencies in many of the economies uh, within the Asia Pacific region. In terms of trying to understand what is really going on, you know, if and if we are trying to improve our security by developing strategies and whatnot, what should we put in there? So we find that there is a gap there where we can play an active role. Uh, so through a lot of the capacity development activities that we do uh, with this community member, we thought about the HoneyNet project as one of the um, initiative that can actually help people think uh, about about security and also get involved in some of the security initiatives that are actively taking places all over the world. So uh, for the seasoned security uh, person, maybe you know you are wondering you know, why honeypots. I looked up when was the first time I spoke about honeypots at a first conference and I found that in 2009, I did a presentation on honeypots and detection. However, in our context of the EPNIC community HoneyNet project, uh, it is more for creating awareness. Uh, I think earlier there was a presentation that talks about maturity, which is a combination of awareness. When you can do, then you can do, you have capacity and capability to do certain things. Uh, we find that in our engagement, yes, you know, people have been dealing with a lot of security issues, but in a lot of cases, the person behind the computer um, is not that experienced or are completely new uh, to the field. So. Uh, by uh, going into the honeypots. And when I say honeypots, we do actually do training uh, using honeypots uh, where people can actually see the attacks and the artifacts. And from there, you know, they can do some analysis. They can appreciate how this works in detection, um, understand a bit of bit about forensics, uh, you know, risk management and so on and so forth. Um, we started to do the training back in 2014 at a BDNOG, so Network Operators Group uh, meeting in, in Bangladesh, where there's a bunch of ISPs. Uh, and it became one of, the, one of the hit training, I would say, uh, since then. And what happens normally after each training is people would be interested in deploying their own honeypots and would like to share information and learn more. So we thought this was a good excuse for us to... Uh, set up this community of people who are running honeypots uh, and nothing much is expected of them un other than you know setting up a honeypot and then you know let's do some things together basically um, i find also that over time it helps us to you know go into some of the more advanced topic uh, or some of the current topics that everyone is discussing today like the micro attack framework so we can easily relate to what people are seeing in their own honeypots into, hey, this is what Mitra Framework is talking about. And let's, let's look at your data. Um, MISP, for example, we've been trying to encourage people to go to the next step by other than collecting information, how about we start a community that share information uh, proactively through MISP uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, and I think most importantly, the main message is let's be proactive and take action before an incident happens. Uh, or let's be more aware about what we do in hardening our environment and infrastructure and customers so that you know when people need to reach out to us we are ready to help uh, and even before people are, are reaching out to us then we are already processing information and taking action and investing some time in security this is my last slide uh, so what is the current state of the project so fortunately um, uh, the the folks at APNIC are very supportive about this particular project uh, because we find that this is a very good excuse for us to do multiple engagements uh, and to focus on various areas. Uh, uh, we use a lot of open source tools and you know, all props and shout out to all the open source tools developers out there. Uh, we are thinking of ways to hopefully support and fund some of these projects in the future so that there is continuity uh, and it will help the developers to enhance the project that we use for free. 
Um, there's been some collaboration as well uh, at our end, uh, mainly with large ISPs, universities, and some national certs. Uh, and of course, we are venturing into trying to create smaller communities where people can proactively share threat information, uh, even if they don't run honeypots. So that's kind of the next steps uh, that we are thinking of. Uh, over time, we have started to share feeds outside the Asia Pacific community. We started to share some small feeds to, with Shadow Server uh, and, and NISP. Internally at APNIC, there is a project that, uh, that is called Dash that provides insights uh, on network belonging to our members. So they can see if there is any suspicious traffic uh, or traffic going to the honeypots, as well as other information about right, routing security uh, and all of that. Um, the main outcome of this HoneyNet project has been in the capacity development activities, as mentioned earlier, talks, workshops, um, including at APCERT, PAXON, and many other security events in the region. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, that one of our concern is a lot of it, a lot of these tools that we use for free, they are being developed on people's free time. Uh, and what can we do as a community to then support them? So that's one of the areas that we are trying to help support and improve. Uh, other than just running honeypots uh, as well. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. And uh, if anyone would like more details on the implementation, because I don't think we have the time for that, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to share information and uh, maybe share some of the lessons learned that we have experienced in running this project. So John Robert, that's my short presentation. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Adli. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you. Um, a lot of things that we can learn from the ethnic experience and that we can replicate uh, within the uh, African internet community. Thank you for, for, for sharing that and sharing for your, your experience. And I hope that as we plan to reach out to you and EPNIC to understand how a similar initiative can be deployed in the African continent. I'm very confident that we'll be there to work with us and with the Afri African community. Thank you so much, Adri. Um, to close this session, I would like to invite uh, Lawrence um, Kirwa to uh, talk to us about his experience. Uh, Lawrence is a cybersecurity engineer with over five years of experience. Uh, he specializes in incident response, threat intelligence, cybersecurity training, uh, leadership, and currently manages the Security Operations Center at SilenceSec. Uh, he is also the lead blue team consultant at CyberRange. Over to you, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online. Okay, over to you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Awesome. I don't know if my screen is a visible, my PowerPoint are visible in the video. Yes. Okay, so should be okay right now. So first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us. A uh, special thanks to Africa Sat and first for giving me this uh, opportunity to just share my experience uh, uh, in regards to cyber threat intelligence. So I will try to be as brief as Adli. Uh, he has set a very <laughs> a good trend. <laughs> so so <clears throat> my talk and discussion will basically revolve around uh, what I've done in regards to uh, establishment of uh, SATs, especially in the African uh, market, having worked with the ITU on a few projects. So most of the speakers that have uh, just come before me are starting from the morning session. We have talked a lot about uh, existing frameworks. Uh, we have talked a lot about consumption of cyber threat intelligence. I want to take a slightly different angle and actually tackle on how we can generate cyber threat intelligence, specifically I would focus on the African uh, context. Uh, just a quick question. Right now we have, I believe around 54 countries uh, in Africa 
in your own time, just try to find how many of those countries are. One, have SATs, and two, how many of those countries are actually generating any form of a cyber threat or intelligence. A lot of us, uh, specifically SATs, and just even organizations, I believe for the last 10, or 10 years or so, we have been doing a very good job consuming cyber threat intelligence. We have uh, matured processes, uh, matured platform, that have done a very good job in line to supporting this. However, more often or not, I've come across a question by SATs, by the actual practitioners either manning these SATs, basically asking us or asking me in certain cases that, how can we start consuming and one, generating our own feeds and consuming those feeds and sharing those feeds with our other peers. So the question here comes to how do we generate relevant CTI in an environment where we have technical uh, challenges in regards to a competencies point of view, where budget, politics, and trust play a role. And in most cases, uh, these four are always trying to uh, slow you down. Now, before we handle that list, let me just go back and uh, reiterate a few things that I've shared uh, and just uh, touched on. I believe it's a fact that CTA consumption has matured. All the speakers are from the morning session are actually proof of this. A lot of platforms, a lot of frameworks, a lot of maturity models all geared towards uh, this uh, common goal. CTI sharing platform also have a matured. MISP is a playing a very important role now, and it's just not only MISP. Other players are coming into the market at help this. However, CTI generation in most cases has always been centered around deploying honeypot. So deploy this honeypot, deploy that honeypot, and you get CTI. This begs the question, are we finding ourselves in a situation where we have these amazing Ferraris or amazing cars, but you are lacking competent, uh, competent drivers who can actually actualize the benefit these Ferraris are meant to uh, offer the community, offer SATs or any other organizations who might be interested into generating their own uh, cyber threat uh, intelligence. Having that in mind still comes back to our question, how do we ensure that organizations such are able to generate relevant CTI uh, in their environment? So <clears throat> I, won't, I won't definitely not want to bore everyone with that. the whole uh, threat intelligence generation uh, framework and cycle and all that. I'm going to choose to focus on three aspects, planning, direction and collection, specifically when uh, you are thinking of uh, generating threat intelligence. So first, in these discussions, one of the key things that comes out or that came out even in my engagement is uh, as an organization, as a such, you need to know your constituency and uh, what is important and uh, relevant to them. I'll give an example. So one of the national SATs you're actually working with, they had multiple uh, constituencies and each constituency was very specific in regards to the kind of uh, intelligence one they want to generate and are interested, uh, interested in. So for one constituency, they are more interested in, uh, can we get visibility on everything related to HTTP traffic, related to API. Another constituency, different approach. For them, they are interested in RDP, SSH. When you also get people who are playing uh, in the OT space, totally different uh, requirement. Planning and direction also helps build on top of what other speakers have mentioned, public-private partnership. As a SAT, 
I stand corrected, but it's virtually impossible for you to have a meaningful visibility uh, in regards to sensors uh, 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 for all your traffic because you have the private sector doing their own things. You have the, uh, the academia doing their own things in regards to traffic. The only way these, you get this visibility is by actually engaging and working with this uh, public-private uh, partnership. Then there's that aspect of a uh, shared uh, prosperity. For this specific set, one of the main thing that actually helped uh, this collaboration uh, was uh, the shared uh, prosperity. Basically telling one constituency that whatever you are generating is going to help someone else. Whatever they are working on is also going to come and circle back and uh, help you. So that was uh, a game changer. Then uh, threat modeling. So threat modeling basically goes back to planning and direction in that each constituency might be facing different threats and it's only helpful and meaningful for them to actually collect intelligence related to their threat modeling. Now, if ha having figured out the planning and uh, direction phase, the most important thing now is uh, the collection how are we going to use uh, the planning phase input and direct it to the collection uh, phase? So I will skip this. Uh, I, this slide uh, uh, keeps appearing because uh, the main point is here, the main point here is uh, being able to collect these uh, relevant uh, CTI. So, <clears throat> The, uh, the constituency model basically works on the stakeholder approach. I believe that's one of the approach that has also been championed by ISOC. Now, when, I'm, when, I, when you're looking at this multi-stakeholder approach, one of the main thing I advocate for, and I've seen some good success with is uh, going horizontal. So basically going horizontal basically means that as a start, instead of uh, trying to lift this heavy burden, utilize uh, what is uh, already existing. So trust has been one of those key things that has been mentioned uh, through this out. As an organization A, it is hard for organization B to trust me if uh, we haven't had this kind of uh, engagement before. However, both A and B will easily trust the a national, a national start or a national entity. So going horizontal is all about public-private partnership being championed by a national entity with focus on a shared uh, prosperity. So identifying your constituency, as I've said, uh, you can't do this uh, alone. Each different constituency, each stakeholder in that constituency will in most cases have visibility that you might not have. Additionally, they also might have competencies that you, you might not have. So instead of uh, trying to reinvent everything and uh, uh, build everything from ground up, identify the right stakeholder, then uh, I work with them. Communication and uh, identify the various champions. So I believe for this particular search, uh, when you are rolling out uh, this uh, deployment, one of the main things that actually helped on board the various constituency and cement the, the trust was uh, the kind of uh, communication uh, the SAT had uh, with this constituency. So these were a mix of uh, physical meetings, virtual meetings, where the constituency were given the platform to ask questions ask the technical questions, the executive question, just for them to understand what the SAT wanted to do and how that technology was actually going to happen. And through asking of these questions, people are also able to fully understand and appreciate what the SAT was actually trying to achieve. This resulted in fostering of transparency and just building and gaining more trust because uh, 
people we rarely like change. If you're going to introduce change and there isn't sufficient communication, you basically introduce a stumbling block in your path. However, if you introduce change and you clearly communicate change at uh, this particular change to the people you are going to work to, the absorption rate greatly, greatly uh, increases. Uh, moving on. So the other thing that, uh, in addition to basically communicating, one of the other things that we actually did was to reduce and eliminate the learning and management overhead. So in most cases, this most constituency and most stakeholders you'll be working, they won't want to increase the technical overload they might be having. They don't want to learn new ways to deploy something or figure how to actually deploy a solution. A strategy that actually worked for us was creating very simple manuals to set up sensors. So you basically tell uh, this particular stakeholder that once you get uh, the sensor configuration, run these two commands. Everything works. Then secondly, uh, one of the things that we actually capitalize on, open source has been, has been mentioned multiple times here. So think of, uh, for instance, creating simple Docker compose files. Create a simple Docker compose file, uh, tell uh, the partner you're working with in this particular constituency, run this particular commander and uh, this sensor uh, will be set up. So just that fact of reducing and completely eliminating that learning and management overhead was very, very uh, beneficial. Because at the end of the day, the constituency definitely are going to benefit from this. However, at the same time, you don't want to labor them with that aspect of uh, now you need to learn Docker. Now you need to do A, B, C, and D. If they do it, well and good, but they should not shoulder uh, that particular responsibility. Now, pricing is always going to be a, main, uh, a major issue. One way to solve this is uh, go very affordable. And one way to go uh, in a very affordable way is uh, actually using open source. So for these particular sensors and honeypots, we actually went with the Docker. So we had uh, Docker containers, then build uh, on top of Elk and uh, a miss just to ensure that the cost that uh, each, the cost, the cost specifically that the SAT was incurring was very minimal, especially when it came to the technical aspect of uh, uh, setting, up, uh, setting up this. Then having done that, so you have reduced uh, or eliminated, eliminated uh, uh, the learning cover the prices, the financial implication is very low. How do you now make use of existing cyber threat intelligence? Now the existing cyber threat intelligence is still meaningful as much as you are even creating your own intelligence. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. One approach to use is actually integrate your, the CTI you are generating with existing CTI. And um, I was very, very pleased and happy uh, to see the Tunisian uh, SAT team actually doing something similar to that, where they basically integrate Shodan with what they are getting, I don't know, maybe to reduce false positive or just to uh, further enrich, uh, enrich the CTI that they are getting. Now, all of these, uh, the main goal is to actually get something similar like this. So at the, uh, at the bottom here, we have the various constituencies. In each constituency, you only deploy one sensor, one sensor running on a physical hardware which can be virtualized. Now in this physical hardware, to ensure we are maximizing all the resources we have, because that also translates into budget, dockerize everything you want to do. So in this particular case, I believe we had one sensor running more than 
five independent honey pots, each custom developed for that particular constitu uh, constituency. Now, given that uh, we are running and uh, minimizing cost, so the sensor was a, a very basic uh, machine, no premium uh, as a specification. Now, everything from the sensor was being shipped to, uh, was actually being shipped to um, uh, the SAT endpoint server, a dedicated server, where all the heavy lifting was being done. Now, from this server, all this information was being enriched with the additional CTIs from uh, other external partners, necessarily a part of that uh, constituency. Now, where the constituency felt the value and benefited from this was that each constituency was actually able to access those feeds via an access, a role-based access control system. So in this case, you ship your logs from the honeypot. The honeypot reaches the, uh, the SATS infrastructure. SAT does any analysis enrichment that needs to be done. Then as a constituency, you are able to actually make use, make sense of uh, that particular information uh, that you have uh, collected. So that brings me to an end. Uh, my main aim and goal was just to share my experience in regards to an approach that uh, we have used uh, in deploying SAT, uh, in deploying Honeypot and uh, helping uh, SATs, especially in the African context, generate uh, cyber threat intelligence. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, over to you, Jane. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for sharing with us uh, uh, your experience in deploying such initiative and making also uh, cyber threat intelligence effective in a resource constrained environment. Um, on this note, uh, I'm not sure that we have enough time for questions but uh, you are welcome to send your question or put your question in the chat uh, we will uh, respond to